Cecily, it's so great to have you on to discuss your fantastic work, The Army Under Fire, The Politics of Anti-Militarism in the Civil War Era. Thank you for your time. Thank you, John. Thanks for uh, making time for me. I know it's later there in Canada than it is here in Texas. So, <laughs> it's Just a little bit later, but that's okay. It's only an hour. It's fine. At least I'm warm, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, it was 85 here today, so you know, oh. I don't know what that is in Celsius, but still pretty warm. That's okay. I'm an American, so I still I go back and forth between the degrees. And uh, today, I believe we got we had a heat wave. We got up over 50 degrees today. So wow, that's weird for here. <laughs> yeah, for March. Yeah, we had a 90 degree day last week in February, and I I was a little concerned. Yeah. I, I won't lie. <laughs> I don't miss that because the bugs are bigger. And uh, yeah, <laughs> I oh, miss they're out. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Two. I don't. I'm not a bug guy, so that's not me neither. Be, I'll take the cold and I have to, I'm one of those guys who's a wuss and has to yell for his wife to come get the spider. So <laughs> it's not, I'm a terrible husband, uh, but uh, I'm so glad to uh, finally meet you digitally and, and to have read your book, which we're going to go into here in a little bit from LSU press. Uh, but Cecily, I would love for you to talk with everyone uh, listening about how history started for you? What was the spark that really got you interested in the past? Okay, yeah, it's a good question. Um, and it's a question that kind of explains why I wrote the book I wrote um, in the end. Uh, so I grew up, I was born and raised in um, Colorado, near Boulder, Colorado. So I grew up in the West, consider myself a Westerner, um, love the mountains. And both my parents, my whole family were from North Dakota, so um, practically Canadians um, in some ways. And uh, and so we would spend most of our summers um, driving across Wyoming and South Dakota, Montana, North Dakota. And my dad specifically is from Mandan, uh, which is where um, Lewis and Clark spent their winters going back and forth uh, to the Pacific with the Corps of Discovery, actually a little north of present day Mandan in a town called Washburn, but also where the U S army built Fort Abraham Lincoln after the civil war, uh, which is where George Custer and the seventh cavalry uh, were stationed uh, before they uh, went on their vacation to Montana and did not come back. And, uh, and uh, I think, um, you know, for, for good or for ill, when I was about five or six, um, I'd been there enough times that I could probably have given you the start of a lecture about George Custer and the, the U.S. Army on the frontier. Mm -hmm. um, so it was the it was that kind of physical history. It was those public history sites. It was those those public historians and interpreters who brought the past to life. And I think that's irresistible for a young child. Um, the Fort Abraham Lincoln site also features the earth lodges, reconstructed earth lodges of the Mandan Indian nation, which were just amazing to see as a kid. So also this kind of sense of cross-cultural connection. And um, it was just a normal part of my growing up that we would spend our summers visiting these historic sites. Um, Fort Laramie, I mean, in Wyoming, um, been to Mount Rushmore more times than I can count. So I think I naturally tended toward it. I was kind of a speech and debate kid in high school. I was interested in history, interested in politics, interested in um, kind of rhetoric and writing. And I always loved to read. So and my brother and I are total opposites in this regard. He had the exact same experience as me growing up and he's, he's become a carpenter. So we went, we did very different uh, directions. And so I wouldn't say, it was anything that was forced. I'm sure my parents are still a little bit confused, though. Um, one of my mentors uh, did ask my mom once if if they had a sense I might become a historian. And she sort of pondered it for a second and said, well, she did ask us to tape the Antiques Roadshow on PBS. So <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was probably a sign. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so so I, I, I knew that Western history super, super well, or I felt like I did. Um, and then I decided... I don't know, radical uh, decision, wanted to get away from where I grew up. So I decided to go to college in Virginia. Um, uh, on the one hand, I, I, you know, I think I, I got waitlisted a lot of places. I only got in a couple. I was really fortunate to get into the University of Virginia. So I thought, hey, it's going to be the same, basically the same price tag. So kind of why not go on an adventure? And mm -hmm. as you might imagine, the University of Virginia being situated where it is, 
Um, you can either become really interested in Thomas Jefferson or the Civil War. Those are kind of your two your two choices. Right. And um, you know, Thomas Jefferson is nice, but I thought, you know, why not um, kind of really delve into the Civil War? And what attracted me to it was the fact that I knew all of the names already. I just knew them in a different context. So I knew them in their, their Western context. I knew who Sherman and Sheridan and Custer were, but I knew them for what they had done in the West, not what they had done in the Civil War. And so it was like kind of coming, piecing together a, an incomplete story that I had kind of getting into the Civil War in college and then in grad school, deciding that's kind of what I wanted to study. As you know, when you go to grad school, they basically tell you, you got to pick, <laughs> you know, it's still okay to love all of history, but you have to kind of pick your your focus and and what I increasingly found in the the literature that uh, that I was reading about the Civil War was there was this impression that the Civil War created a, a new American army that it was more powerful it was more equipped to go into the West and complete the kind of conquest and and colonization of the American West and I just kept thinking to myself well I keep going to all those places and that's not what they say they say out west they would have been miserable and you would have hated it and the soldier's life was was terrible and desertion was a third of the army every year mm. and so I decided that I wanted to resolve that kind of problem and take those two historiographies which um, have often not been in conversation or sort of have been wrestled reluctantly into conversation um and and try and actually um see if I could figure out why there is an impression that the civil war created this fundamentally new and different army. Well, at the same time in these kind of public history sites, why it's not being interpreted that way. And so the book that I wrote was my attempt to answer that question. And, and I think I got fortunate. Um, you can try to predict and, you know, for graduate students who listen to this, you can try to predict what the trends are going to be. You can try and sort of figure out if you can write that dissertation that's going to be the cutting edge thing. You can't gamify the market. I got lucky. There's a, a whole wave of historians and many of them have been on your show, John, that that work on the Civil War in the West. It's a it's a new and emerging kind of field. And so um, I'm excited I get to join that conversation, but I just got lucky in my timing. It wasn't a planned kind of attack um, to try and join this conversation. Um, um, though, if any, if you have advice for how someone can do that, I'm sure the grad students would love to hear it because uh, it would be nice to be on trend. Uh, it's so hard to predict where the field's going to go, but right now this is kind of where it's tending, at least part of it. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. Civil War historians are can cantankerous. They like to go their own way. So, um, you know, some of them are willingly going that way and others are less willingly going that mm -hmm. way, but um, mm -hmm. they're going. So so that's kind of where I, I sit. And that's how I came to came to write the book that I wrote, I think. Mm -hmm. um, at least that's what I've convinced myself. So there's history <laughs> and memory. That's my... <laughs> That's a great that's a great description of why it works. Yeah. And uh, it's also good for anyone listening uh, to uh, or to or watching to understand that it's awesome to have a good network of peers and colleagues to help you along the way with yeah. getting the word out there about what you're doing, because when your peers and colleagues are excited about what you're doing, then it's a whole different ball game, in my opinion. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so so I've had sort of wonderful so mentors in all kinds of different ways. So um, sort of either implicitly or explicitly. My graduate school advisor was Bill Blair at Penn State. He taught me how to write better. He was a journalist before he decided to become a historian. So he has this uncanny ability to find an incredible quote, you know, like they do in a newspaper where it's like they they managed to interview, you know, he would tell me, you know, you've quoted four people here. Pick the good quote put the other three in the footnote, stop boring everybody, you know? And, and my undergraduate advisor was Gary Gallagher, who kind of, he knows everybody in the civil war field and has kind of steadfastly supported this project. And he always reminds me, and I'm sure he said it on your show, you know, follow the evidence. And that's what I tried to do. If you follow the evidence, you can't go wrong. And, and I was amazed as I wrote my book, how much evidence I had for my argument. Um, and then I've had some great mentors in Western history, too, who I feel like don't get mentioned so much on the kind of Civil War podcast, but they've been sort of relentlessly helpful in um, kind of teaching me to get the word out about my book. So folks like Ari Kelman and Andy Graybill, who have been wonderful kind of um, in helping me speak to 
to that field, which is not my natural kind of disposition. So yeah, I've been super, super fortunate to have good people um, looking out for me. And um, I think I remembered them all in the acknowledgements, but I'll say to anyone I forgot, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. It happens. Yeah. But yes, you can't, we can't remember everybody, but we but, sure try <laughs> to do yeah. that. Uh, Cecily, when I started to dive into the book and uh, thumb through it originally, because I usually just skim through first before I read to see where we're heading, I immediately realized that I've been wrong about <laughs> the U.S. Army <laughs> from the antebellum era and the post-war era. Uh, so I was really excited to dive deeper and to realize why I was wrong. And uh, did you have a similar experience at all growing up in the West and, and hearing about things out there? Like you said, you kind of alluded to it. But as far as the size of the military force uh, compared to the post-Civil War era, uh, was did you also have that kind of a aha moment or were you kind of already thinking that way? Um, it's a good question. So for the pre-war period, um, like everybody else, I've always um, sort of been told it was a tiny army and that's why it was so unprepared to fight the Civil War. And, you know, that's it was only 16 regiments. It was a small army. Um, but if you look at their the way that they were scattered all across the country, you really can see a pattern and they were being used quite strategically. So even though it was a small army, it was being used to really great effect because Southern Democrats um, were very explicit in placing the army in positions to help slavery expand into Texas and New Mexico and Arizona. Um, and uh, then they hoped Kansas and Nebraska as well. Um, and then after the Civil War, I would say from growing up, I had a sense that it was a small army, but I also had a sense of, and this is what I think sometimes folks who kind of write from the Eastern perspective lack, how big the West is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, that, that you also have to have a sense of, um, even if there were technically more soldiers, the space that they had to cover, you know, if you've ever stood in the middle of Wyoming, uh, first of all, I'm sorry <laughs> for whatever <laughs> took you to that place in your life, but, um, but you'll know, like it's wind, it's tumbleweeds, it's an occasional antelope. Um, and you can imagine if you're out there and you've been told to go find somebody, your first thought would be, where, where am I supposed to look like? It's just vast emptiness. And so I had a real sense of place, I think, and, um, and a, a way to relate that size to the place. I think if you've never been to the West, it's harder to do that. Um, and, and, you know, like I said, I've spent plenty of time in, in North Dakota and, and, uh, you know, most Americans will get to a lot of States in their lifetime. And, and I think for those who get to all 50, North Dakota is often the last one because people, have this genuine sense that there's nothing to see there. It, there's incredible things to see there, but it, it is just this perception of kind of vast emptiness. And, mm -hmm. and so um, regardless of the size of the army, the task that they had in front of them was gargantuan. And, and it's really funny because I can say that time and again, and, and again, unless you've literally stood there, like even you can't really capture it on film and video. Um, like, I don't know, have you ever been to the Grand Canyon? No, I've never been. I've I've only ever once been west of the Mississippi River. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah, well, when you, when you see the Grand Canyon in pictures, I'm sure you think in your mind, like, it's big. Right. But when you look into it, it's like, no, no I had no idea how big this thing was. And so mm -hmm. that's kind of the, the experience. And that's what the Army's leadership, kind of when they're talking about, when they're trying to communicate to politicians in Washington – who have also never been west of the Mississippi, they're like, you do not understand how much you're asking us to do and how much space there is out here. I mean, I think I did the calculations. There's like one soldier for every five or six square miles of territory. And and one guy can't even do that in a day. And they're in these little kind of pockets and it's imperfect. You can't respond to everywhere all the time. And and nowadays we have a sense that at the drop of a hat, our, our soldiers could be wherever they need to be, not just in the U.S., but anywhere in the world. And mm -hmm. they just didn't have that capability. So um, they are a small army after the war. They're, they, 
eventually kind of settle around 25,000 um, for the West. And, and um, they find it a really tough job. And again, a third of that army deserts year over year um, because again, they, people can just walk off. No one's going after that guy. Like, yeah, you're not going to find them. You know, good luck to him. Yeah. I've been watching this um, show. It's on Amazon. It's a co-production of the BBC and and the Amazon. It's called The English. It's about the kind of postbellum West. There's some soldiers in it, but it's funny. They're like in Wyoming and Nebraska, and they're supposed to be riding across these vast spaces, and yet they keep running into the protagonists and antagonists, just keep running into each other. And I'm like, the only unbelievable thing about this, it's really good on its history. The only unbelievable thing about it is how they keep finding each other out there because <laughs> there's no way they were just, you know, you don't randomly run into someone, but it's yeah. the size of it that I think it's impossible to convey in writing as well. Like I can break down the statistics that way, but one thing I wish the book could do is like you could open it and kind of just suddenly be standing there and, and seeing it. And I know, um, you know, Gary told me he went to Montana a few years back and, and he had lived in Texas and Texas is big. Um, and Montana's not that big, but something about the curve of the earth or whatever, but the sky is just bigger. It, it, it is. It's truly just, you know, it's, it's something about the vastness of it. But, mm. um, but yeah, so I think it's really hard for folks who haven't been that way to understand um, the task the army had to do. And um, when you add on the fact that they also had to deal with reconstruction, it becomes, you know, an even bigger, even more impossible uh, a task to achieve. I don't know if that answers the question, but that kind of, yeah. that's how that Western experience kind of, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll also note as a Westerner, as a Colorado, you know, I, I went to, to Banff as a kid. Cause we thought, Oh, we'll go see the Canadian Rockies. And we got there and we were like, Oh, so it's the same. <laughs> yeah. We sort of turned around and went home. We were like, yeah, oh. it's the same. <laughs> yeah. yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. It's gorgeous, but it's the same. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And and on the prairies out up here, uh even less people than yeah. than than down in the United States. Yeah. So it's yeah. really strange because I believe it's uh uh you know, most people live within 110 miles of the US border here in Canada. Yeah. So you get out there in yeah. the West and you go yeah. 250 miles north of the border and there's nobody. Right, and that's right. like that's to the Arctic. Yeah, know? yeah. So yeah. it's crazy. Yeah, I've been to the only Canadian provinces I've been to are the Prairie provinces. I'd love to go oh. to the to eastern ones. And oh yeah, good friend who lives in Halifax, but I don't know how I'm ever going to get to Nova Scotia. It just seems so far away. But um, I'd love to see it. There you go, everybody. Buy more books, and Cecily can get to the <laughs> get to the Maritimes. And, and, That's right. and talk about that kind of history as well. Uh, look, dress like the Gordon fisherman and, and That's you'll, be, right. you'll be good to go. Perfect. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, before we uh, dive into the ideas of around Manifest Destiny and the antebellum uh, era a little bit more, I do want to give a shout out to your book cover. And we talked yeah. a little bit about this before we came on. On, on here but the book cover is absolutely insane in a great way and uh i would love to know where this came from and uh the little secret behind it as well that you showed me that i had no idea what was going on yeah um so I, i've been telling people that i i contacted the ghost of thomas nast and he he <laughs> whipped that up for me but yeah he actually just you know Thomas Nass, the great uh, political kind of first great kind of political satirist cartoonist who who um, drew lots of Harper's Weekly covers and and usually, you know, drew um, something in opposition to whatever the present day kind of political mania was, which means that, you know, his own politics are hard to chart because he he was sort of more an oppositionalist than he was any kind of idealist. But um he drew this for a, a Harper's Weekly cover in the late 1870s, and um, the the U.S. Congress had passed another bill to reduce the army, which they essentially do year over year um, after the Civil War. They just try to shrink, shrink, shrink the army. And um, obviously what he's trying to convey is the language that leading army officers use, that the army is a skeleton. It's not an army at all. It's basically bones. There's no flesh on this. We have no men. We have no ability to actually do the jobs that you want us to do. Um, so, yeah, it's a kind of a skeleton impaling himself in front of um, an image of Columbia. Um, 
And um, it's just a great cartoon. So it's a Thomas Nast uh, Harper's Weekly cover. And uh, I didn't know LSU did this. They didn't tell me. It was like a little surprise for me to sort of uncover. And so obviously I've been telling everyone, but if you actually take the jacket off, the image is imprinted on the front boards of the book, which is, uh, which is so super cool. Um, it was so cool that they did that. And I'm so grateful to them because I kind of, um, some LSU books are just printed. They print the cover directly on the boards. They don't um, all come with a jacket, but I said, it's my first book and I'm a real book nerd and I would just love to have a jacket. And they were like, yeah, we'll do a jacket. And then they did that little extra bit. So I was just, yeah, they did a great job. They made all my crazy Excel spreadsheet charts look like real charts and graphs and everything. So um, I had a lot of, there's a lot of numbers in the book, a lot of data, and they just made it all look really good. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's a super cool image. And there was another one I, I wanted and folks can look it up. It's got a great tagline too. It was a, another year and another army reduction bill, but it shows kind of the U S Congress and there's a wood picket fence in front of um, the Capitol building and, and uncle Sam's kind of sitting on a stump and there's a soldier kind of with his knees drawn up in front of him. And a, again, a skeleton kind of face and, and the, the kind of punchline or the tagline for the cartoon was uncle. This reminds me of Andersonville. So again, just conveying like how um, poorly treated uh, the professional regular army was. And maybe that's something we talk about next is I think something about the book that um, surprises people is that anti-militarism because they probably assume I'm talking about like every single soldier in the civil war era. And I'm, I'm really talking about a small subsection. And that's one of the key things that I hope the book will remind people about is this question of like, there are multiple different types of armies that we have in this period of U.S. history. Hmm. And my interest is really in that professional army, that regular army of the United States that nobody really likes all that much. But um, um, so that's the kind of that's what I'm referring to with the anti-militarism, because uh, um, obviously book titles are book titles. But uh, <laughs> I hmm. think that it throws up a major flair for people when they're like, wait. She's claiming that nobody liked the army during the Civil War. <laughs> no, right. I promise. I promise. I'm really not. <laughs> yeah, there was definitely a stark difference between how the regular army was seen and how the volunteer force was seen. It all goes back to trust, right? Right, right. And um, and this is, I get a real kind of bugbear about, um, there's been conversation among Civil War historians, and people come down different ways about this, but um, about wanting to call not wanting to use the term union army anymore um mm. and instead calling every soldier who fought in the civil war it, saying they fought in the u.s army because mm. it grants more legitimacy like they were fighting for the united states but the u.s army was never incorporated with the union armies um, which were the federalized volunteer armies were the union armies and they were called that at the time mm. um, the u.s army was the regular professional army which was purposefully kept separate because its soldiers and officers could not be trusted to intermingle with citizen soldier volunteers. And so um, that's one of my real kind of um, things I'll stand really firm about. I mean, I'm not going to wade into the, well, I don't know, we call it Twitter X, whatever. I'm not going to actually wade into the discourse, um, yeah. but I have sort of strong thoughts about it because um, if you actually pay attention to what's going on at the time, the U S army is a very different thing to the union army, the union volunteer army, is 97% of soldiers who serve in the war. Um, the U.S. Army, the regular army, is only 3%. And again, they're kept totally separate because they're viewed as aristocratic. They're viewed as martinets. They're viewed as conservative uh, with a lowercase c, but also um, strongly suspected to be Democrats with a capital D. Um, and therefore um, opposed or emancipation. And um, there, of course, Avatar is George McClellan. Um, mm -hmm. Professional soldiers are all seen to be these kind of McClellan-esque figures who do not want to fight the same kind of war that the Republican Party, which is in full majority in Congress and, and the presidency, wants them to fight. Um, and, and they don't want to actually take the war to the Confederates. It's the volunteers and the volunteer officers who, who kind of are willing to do that. Of course... It's very silly to say that. Um, plenty of West Point graduates helped lead the Union to victory. Um, 
among them, U.S. Grant and William Tecumseh Sherman and Philip Sheridan. But keep in mind that um, a lot of those guys were were soldiers who had gotten out of the army in the 1850s and pursued careers in civilian lives and come back. So um, they're a little less suspect. But if you were in the army all the way through, if you were a guy like George Meade or George McClellan, um, I'm pretty suspicious. McClellan does get out for just a second, but um, um, you're viewed as pretty pretty suspicious by virtue of your association with this hierarchical, aristocratic, um, frankly, un-American uh, institution. Because as we know, this debate goes back to the founding era. Standing armies are antithetical to democratic republics. And George Washington has to deal with this at Newburgh when his soldiers threatened to, you know, march on the Continental Congress. And he's like, y'all, no, mm -hmm. <laughs> they already don't like you. <laughs> you can't, you know, he has to diffuse this conspiracy before the Republic goes up in flames before it's even gotten going because um, um, standing armies are um, Caesar-esque, they're Cromwell-esque, they're Napoleon-esque, and they're threats to democracy. And so you have to keep them small. You have to send them far away from the centers of population and power. So send them out West in, in the American case um, and don't trust them for a second um, unless you figure out how to make them your tool, uh, which is what slaveholders do in the 1850s is they, they, they kind of weaponize uh, the army, no pun intended, um, to help slavery expand into the West. Yeah, I'd love to hear uh, more on that, Cecily, because when we when people will look at your book title some people don't uh see the scope of the civil war era they think it's just <laughs> 1861 1865 and and a lot of us uh have redefined or not redefined but we we have labeled civil war era as being uh you know both bookends as well of the civil war era because you can't tell one story without telling yeah. the next iteration of it that mm -hmm. army that that grant and 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 uh, others were a part of in 1848 and and other eras in the antebellum years what was that army like as far as being funded and placed uh compared to what they'll witness later on sure so they were they were their best selves i would say they were kind of um if you if you could have chosen any decade to be a professional soldier, um, you would have chosen the 1850s because not only was the army expanding and was it, its funding was increasing year over year, they added four regiments, which is a huge number uh, of soldiers to add. It's the largest increase to the army up until that point outside of a period of, of actual war. So obviously they they kind of have a dry run for the Civil War in Mexico. A lot of the professional officers from West Point get a real taste of what leadership is like in Mexico. But they go back. Um, the army contracts in the 1850s after the war with Mexico. But then you have um, the election of Franklin Pierce in 1852. So a doe faced one of these, uh, as we, we call them, a northern man with southern principles. So he's he's a northern guy. He's not a slaveholder himself, but he supports slaveholding policies. And most importantly, he supports the kind of rights uh, of slaveholders to carry their enslaved people into the West. Um, and he appoints Jefferson Davis as his secretary of war. Davis himself, a graduate of West Point, a veteran of the Mexican War, one of the wealthiest men in America, uh, one of the largest slaveholders in the South, um, and a tireless advocate for slave expansion. And, and Davis understands how to work the War Department to his favor. And so um, he... He proposes a four regiment increase to the army. One of the units that gets created out of that is the second cavalry. Um, its officers include Albert Sidney Johnston, Robert E. Lee, um, Jeb Stewart. Um, you have um, George Thomas, who's a Virginian and is assumed to have Southern sympathies. Obviously we know um, he ends up choosing um, to turn his back on Virginia, unlike Lee. Um, and so you have all these guys who are going to become basically leading lights in the Confederate army in this single regiment, which after the war, people are like, that's a little weird that Jefferson Davis did that. I mean, it was totally coincidental, but right. Jefferson Davis did um, make sure that he put his best soldiers in these new regiments, which went to Texas and to the, to the Southern kind of tier of the country. 
um, and helped pave the way for slavery to move um, into Texas, to move further west into Texas. Davis um, oversees several railroad surveys, um, four different routes that the Transcontinental Railroad might go. Um, he puts more time and money into surveying the southern route that would cut across Texas. He advocates for that one to Congress. Um, mm. uh, a third of the army is in Texas alone prior to the war. Um, another third is in New Mexico and Arizona. Um, and the rest are scattered across California and the Pacific Coast. There's really almost no attention to the Great Plains. Um, but I think the most kind of galling thing that Pierce and Davis do is uh, in the crisis in Kansas and the debate over whether Kansas will have a, a, a slave kind of constitution or a free state constitution. Um, Davis and Pierce approve the use of the army to disperse the free state legislature of Kansas and actually force the advocates of free Kansas to break up their meeting to approve the constitution of Kansas that would have made it, uh, had it come into the union as a free state at gunpoint, uh, literally at the point of a bayonet. Um, and, and for a lot of people, this is a really kind of shocking moment that U S soldiers are being sent to basically deny the first amendment rights of citizens who are meeting um, fully in accordance with their kind of constitutional <laughs> ability to do so and being told that the president and the army will not let them kind of approve this free constitution. And, and the army becomes painted essentially as a weapon of these slaveholding politicians, what the Republican party, as it comes into being, will label the slave power. Mm -hmm. That, that carries over very long term <laughs> and, yeah. and has implications for well beyond uh, Kansas and, and the spread into Texas. Uh, is this where we start to really see that party divide just concrete itself in Washington, yeah. D.C., where there's definitely a dividing line between the idea of using this army to increase power uh, in general and, and they also having this other side saying, we don't even like this idea in the first place. And now it's being used by someone else to their political advantage. Right, exactly. And so in 1854, when those four regiments are added to the army, it's, it's a fairly uncontested vote, actually. Um, sorry, the, the, the Whig Party um, voted about the same in terms of military issues as the Democrats. Mm -hmm. So the Whigs were not an explicitly kind of anti-army party. But I make the argument in the book that sort of basically after the crisis in Kansas, as the Republican Party comes into being in, in part inspired by that crisis or galvanized by it, um, they make anti-militarism a centerpiece of their political thinking. Because as we know, the Republican Party platform in 1860, it has one plank, the non-extension of slavery into the territories. If you follow the logic of that, the one tool that has helped slavery expand time and time again is the army. And the army has been a tool of slaveholders. So to be anti-slavery, as the Republicans claim to be, is also to be in opposition to the army. And when the Civil War breaks out after Lincoln's election and 313 officers of the United States Army resign their commissions and join a war of treason against the federal government. All those Republicans who are now the majority because their Democratic colleagues have left, they're like, see, we told you. Um, and even though the, the majority far and away of soldiers stay, and, and even though many Southern-born soldiers like George Thomas stay and fight for the Union, Winfield Scott, another great example, um, they're still like, well, we can't trust you because, because you've been under the influence, you've been under the thumb of these slaveholders, and, and you have to prove to us that you can fight this war to win the Union. But when George McClellan is the first guy that you choose to put in charge, you know, you're basically just confirming what you already believed is that professional soldiers are um, not going to be the guys who have what it takes to win the war. And uh, my favorite example of this in the book is um, an Ohio senator named John Sherman, who's constantly writing letters to his brother um, about how professional soldiers are terrible and they're not going to be able to win the war. And, um, you know, they're actively detrimental to the Union war effort. 
and his brother happens to be William Tecumseh Sherman, <laughs> who I'm sure was receiving those letters like, what <laughs> What do you want me to do? Like, I'm not sure what course of action you'd like me to pursue here, but like, um, give us a chance, you know, let us, let us, you know, at least try. And so, um, so like, even at the level of, of, you know, a Republican Senator whose brother is going to be one of the three most important soldiers in the entire war. He's like, I don't know. I don't trust you people <laughs> um, throughout the entirety of the war. And it doesn't change, you know, when McClellan is out and it doesn't change um, when Grant comes in. I think Grant's viewed as too kind of insulated from politics to be really appealing to the Republicans either way. Grant was kind of very studied in his mm -hmm. unwillingness to put his thumb on the political scale. Um, the other problem is the very few Republican officers they can identify are John Pope. <laughs> and yeah. that, that's not, <laughs> that's not right. It's not going to work. So <laughs> yeah. um, they have that problem, which is a secondary, but um, also, you know, difficult problem for them. Cause um, the few guys that they have, the John Fremonts and the John Popes are like middling to bad in terms of their military ability. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this leads into this idea of the committee on the conduct of the war then right because you you have this disconnect of trust and it's almost like uh uh kind of like what we see in our modern political sense where if something someone does something and they're of a different uh thought process political party whatever you immediately have to have an investigation <laughs> and and exactly. it seems like the committee on the conduct of the war is kind of like the great great grandfather of that yeah. movement right yeah, oh, absolutely. Guys with absolutely no military experience, not a single one of them had ever picked up a musket, let alone fired one. They probably would have run away in fear. Um, they're like, we have some very serious opinions about how this war should be being waged. And we're going to we're going to grill these generals about every decision they make on the battlefield with no context for the stress, pressure, chaos of a battlefield. And then we're going to issue incredibly lengthy reports explaining what we think they could have done better. It's it, they're amazing documents. And there's really only one book on the joint committee. It's a wonderful book by a historian named Bruce Tapp, but they are, they are a group um, that deserves to be studied more. It's a joint committee, of course, and they put some Democrats on there, but they're not, they put basically ones that are so junior that they can have no, real effect it's again it's basically radical republicans kind of running roughshod over the party but it's very funny though they do do very serious investigations into a series of disasters and they actually do um, one of three congressional investigations into the massacre at sand creek so there are they do some sort of really interesting and good things um as well um but they're for the most part they just kind of make themselves look pretty silly and the generals just, it's a thorn in their side. They, you know, you have letters from Meade, McClellan, you know, what have you. It's like, I have to go before the joint committee today. It's just going to be an absolute waste of time. Meanwhile, John Pope's like, when can I come in? I'd love to come talk to you about what I think. And they're like, yes, please come. And they just kind of, you know, sit there and pump each other up. But, um, and then, you know, they're like, okay, now go do something. And Pope's like, I would rather not. I would, <laughs> but actually I'm going to, I'll go to Minnesota. And yeah. propose an invasion of Canada, which is my favorite thing John Pope does in the Civil War. He's like, so all of the Sioux and Lakota, they've run into Canada. So the best thing we could do is chase them into Canada. And Lincoln is like, absolutely not. No. You've done enough. No. Yeah. It's not going to yeah. work. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I, I hear about that plenty up here yeah. <laughs> uh, because I'm in War of 1812 country. I hear yeah. about it plenty when they hear my accent. And uh, yeah. they're like, yeah, we, we beat you twice. And it's like, yeah, yeah. I get it. Okay. Uh, and, and you're like, nobody in America knows what that war is. It's fine. No, no. Yeah, yeah. No one knows what this is. It's fine. You know, you can have it. Um, yeah. How, Cicely, th this might be a little bit out of the scope, but I, but I think it's something worth noting is how do you think these politicians and their constituents saw the Union Army veteran as compared to the U S army veteran in the post civil war years, did they, because of this idea, did they see these, this group as the true hero and this group as the, okay, you were there happy for you, yeah. but we still don't trust you. Or what was yeah. the, what was that kind of a, a historical memory case on the war itself yeah. for those two? 
you've yeah you've put your finger right on it i mean they the union veteran is the best thing that you could be in the 19th century you know mm -hmm. in terms of sort of whether or not the public is going to um to like you um if you're a citizen soldier volunteer who picked up his musket like george washington or cincinnati uh, and then put it down and went home 10 out of 10 no further questions here's your pension check please vote Republican at the next national election. Um, uh, the professional soldier, I mean, he's a soldier for life and he probably doesn't vote um, or the suspicion is he votes conservative and he's really out of sight, out of mind, um, kind of on the Western frontier. There's a great story of a New York socialite who, who's when walking down the street. She's introduced to a regular army officer Uh about like 1878 it's repeated in sort of army circles and she goes oh oh i thought the army was disbanded after the war just like had no idea that an army still existed kind of an i you know kind of a thing i mean um it's to the point where um politicians make meal out of um this contrast between the professional army and the citizen soldiers and and john logan who is a volunteer officer who has several axes to grind against various professional sort of U.S. regular officers, chief among them, William Tecumseh Sherman, who will become general in chief of the U.S. Army, um, um, decides to use this example of, um, wouldn't you rather spare the money you were proposing to give the army a raise next year and spend it on the widows and the orphans and the, you know, um, wounded men of uh, our veteran kind of class. And wouldn't you rather take that money? And, and he's literally saying all this while Sherman is sitting up in the balcony of the, you know, of, wow. <laughs> of Congress, like listening and Logan's like, and I just really don't think Williams comes to Sherman deserves to get a raise. And it's just going on and on and on. And again, <laughs> I don't know. William Tecumseh to Sherman's my favorite character in the book, and it's hard not to love him. But he just like you can just picture him at various points, just rolling his eyes, and and it really makes like all of his grievance against politics, which everybody kind of loves to quote. You know, mm -hmm. Sherman. You know, I, I will not run if nominated, and will not serve if elected. It makes a lot more sense when you dig into all of this material about you know um, politicians were really mean to him <laughs> um, all of the time and constantly trying to undermine his ability to do his job. And he was like, I'm literally just doing the job that you are asking me to do as the federal government. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, you're asking me to do all of this. And on the other hand, you're telling me that I'm trash and you're not going to give me the funding or the supplies or the men to actually do the job you're asking me to do. <laughs> so, um, you know, you, he, he literally throws up his hands and moves army headquarters to St. Louis. Cause he's like, I, I just can't deal mm -hmm. with, um, with politics anymore um but yeah that's exactly right it's it's the professionals um who we need to reduce in their power we need to underfund them or we need to defund them and, and reduce their numbers and we can take all those savings and we can transfer them into the the lovely pensions that we're going to pay to the to the union veterans and so mm -hmm. yeah it's it's viewed as like a a zero-sum game between the two because supporting one would mean harming the other Mm -hmm. How do you think that had an impact on Reconstruction? Because if you are constantly undermining the budget and, uh, of the U.S. Army and they are also supposed to be keeping the peace, quote unquote, in the South, th doesn't that have a long term effect on Reconstruction efforts? Yeah, I think the way I put it in the book, I genuinely think that um, this is where you see Republican rhetoric kind of outracing their actual political will. Um, and so, you know, I think Eric Foner's unfinished revolution, you know, Reconstruction of America's unfinished revolution, um, is still the best, one of the best books on the topic. He calls it an unfinished revolution. I would say one of the reasons it doesn't sort of fully match up to the rhetoric, especially the, the radical Republicans who want to fully remake the South is that, um, they don't effectively use their best tool for doing so. And so they grudgingly admit that they need to keep an army in the South. Um, they try to arrange it so that they have officers that they trust in charge. So Oliver Otis Howard, trustworthy, stick him in charge of the Freedmen's Bureau. 
he's a safe figure we can work with. Mm -hmm. The second Phil Sheridan gets a little antsy down in Louisiana, he's out. You're going back West. We can't kind of work with you. So they're very careful in who they select and who they choose. But at the same time, they're so focused on this idea that they need to reduce the, the bureaucracy that the war created. They need to bring down the super inflated federal budgets from the war. The federal budget exceeds a billion dollars for the first time at the end of the war, and they need to cut that spending. And they are so committed to this idea that the army is the best place where you can save money, that they're constantly reducing the budget and the number of troops. And so they're, they're undercutting their own ability to, to do their job. And if you actually look at the numbers and where troops are being sent and deployed, the vast majority, the largest decreases in troops in the South happened in 1870, 71, and 72. Um, and I think that's a clear indication that as a, as a matter of political kind of policy or enforceable policy, Reconstruction is really over by 1872. Um, and this lines up with the return uh, of every single former Confederate state has by 1872 returned a constitution that has been approved by the federal government, can now send representatives back to Congress. Its citizens are eligible to vote again. It's kind of fully re-recognized as a state. Um, and so we say that Reconstruction goes on into 1876, but um, I think a lot of that is less um, about politics and actual kind of measurable change because you don't have the agents to enforce that change in the South. They're all kind of drifting back to the West or they're being cut entirely um, from the army. Um, so I think the numbers really show a stark kind of story there. And, and that's one thing I try to, to make an argument about in the book. Mm. Well, you do it very well, Cecily. I really did enjoy the book, honestly. And it was when I, when I, was told about the book uh, by by Gary Gallagher, and he's like, "You have to read this, and you have to have Cecily on for uh, Cecily on for an interview." And I'm like, "Yes, sir, I'll do both," uh, because, like we said before, it's Gary, and when Gary orders you to do something, you do it. He orders in a nice way. That's <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, suggest. We'll say suggest. Yes. That's right. Yeah. yeah. He pokes you in a direction, and you're like, "I felt that. I know what you're yeah. trying to do." Yes, sir. Um, and, and it's a, one of the great joys for me was whenever I could send him a page and he would say, I didn't know that. And I was always like, hooray, <laughs> I wow, found you yeah. know, a, a new <laughs> thing. Uh, if it's new to Gary, I think it's it's really must be new because it um, he knows about everything there is to know about <laughs> about this era. So, yes, the, men, the mentor of so many. Uh, that, yes, we, exactly. Yeah. You know, we can't calculate how many it is. No. Um, but when I when I first heard about the book and got the book and saw the title, I'm like, okay, what direction are we going to go here? And so I wanted to make sure that uh, I had you on to discuss the title as far as how that intersects with what's inside the book. Yeah. And uh, over basically three generations of the U S slash union army, because I'm guilty of yeah. saying the U S army in the civil war. So I have to, yeah. Rethink. It's fine. I'm not going to, I'm not going to change the world on this topic, but I, it's, I do. It's like my little, yeah. like in the, my brain, I'm like, no, <laughs> but yeah. it's fine. Yeah. Um, I understand the argument for it and I understand that there are good reasons, but um, yeah. I would argue it's historically inaccurate and it just depends how much of a stickler you want to be. And, and I'm, yeah. I'm a pretty cantankerous. Uh, I think my main role model in life is Oscar the Grouch from Sesame oh, Street. No. So I'm pretty happy to be. Oh no, I'm more like, I'm more like Gonzo off the Muppets. So it's, it's okay. That's, okay. That's good. Uh, I have the funny cardigans too. So we're good. That's um, perfect. What, what are you going to work on next, Cecily? Anything in particular, or you have a specific interest you're wanting to finally get to after writing this book or, or what's it's, next it's for a you good... in general? Uh, yeah, this is the, you're now free from graduate school question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, I am really excited. I'm working with a couple of colleagues. I already mentioned one, Andrew Graybill, but then another Jeff Engel, who's a historian of the Cold War, um, mm -hmm. sort of U.S. We're, we're putting together a conference that will produce an edited volume on the frontier in the American presidency. So we're kind of asking, how did the American West influence presidents and vice versa? And so we have scholars talking about from Jefferson to Trump. Um, mm -hmm. We're going to have 10 great historians, including T.J. Stiles, um, in, the, in the book. And it's going to be kind of super cool. I'm writing an essay um, on Lincoln and the multiple attempts to bring Colorado into the union. 
um, it, during the Civil War. It fails to come in, even though Nevada does. And so I'm going to kind of compare those two and talk about kind of territorial politics in the Civil War. Um, I'm participating in another symposium about rethinking the Indian Wars. I'm going to write a piece about um, how the Second Seminole War shapes William Tecumseh Sherman's ideas about total war and kind of see if there are antecedents of the march to the sea in his experience in Florida. And then book-wise, I'm not sure I might stick with the Lincoln theme. There, there are not that many for all the books on Lincoln, books about Lincoln in the West. So I'm considering kind of writing a maybe a short but kind of punchy book about that. I'm also really interested in um, something that comes up in this book but is not fully explored, but territorial militias is another type of military unit that exists in the West and their relationship, especially to kind of the violence of, of Western settlement. So those are a few mm -hmm. of the kind of things. I kind of feel like I'm constantly doing something, but I'm, I'm most excited about this presidency and the frontiers thing. Cause I think it'll be, it's going to be a lot of fun to see what people come up with. Um, we're pretty excited. So it'll be a public event here in Dallas in October. And then the book will follow, you know, 18 months, two years down the line, you know, you're, you're, you're relying on multiple people, right. To meet deadlines, but we're really excited about it. So it should be a lot of fun. That's great. Please let me know more information about that. I can pass it on to my listeners and watchers and uh, let everyone sure. know about that. Cause I'm yeah. sure I have a few uh, colleagues and friends who are in Texas or surrounding that massive yeah. area. And uh, we'd yeah. love, love to stop in. We could get a panel together for you have on the show. This works so well. Oh, yeah. So. Sure. I'd love to do that. I'd love to help out in any way I can. So uh, that's, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming on and talking about uh, your book, Cecily. It really does mean a lot to me that you talked about this. And I'm so glad to see uh, Civil War scholarship going off in many directions now, uh, instead of yeah. just the kind of books that I grew up with, maybe that you grew up with, too. Uh, yeah. we're, we're starting to go in so many different directions because it needs to be done. And I can't wait to see what uh, comes out next and what you work on next. I'm sure it's going to yeah. be awesome. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, I'm, I feel lucky to be part of a generation that's kind of pushing those, those boundaries. So yeah, I have a lot of fun. Thank you for having mm -hmm. me on. I really appreciate it. You're very welcome. <laughs>